Can Elsa really create life? Is there a Walt Disney Company in Arendelle? And is there any order in the world of Frozen? Here are some big questions that we're still left with from the Frozen movies. The very first sequence in Frozen shows a group of ice harvesters, well, harvesting ice. Naturally, they sing as they do, harmonizing about how though they must chomp away at the ice they mine, everyone must beware the frozen heart, hinting at a key plot point later on in the film. The men chip away at large formations of ice and carry stacks of it away in a sled pulled by a reindeer. Alongside the team is a young boy with a baby reindeer and miniature sleigh of his own, happy to do his part. The boy affectionately calls the reindeer Dear Sven, implying they have an established relationship as pet owner and pet. We later come to know the young boy as Kristoff, but we never discover just how he and Sven became a duo. It could make for an adorable origin story. Sven sticks by Kristoff's side through adulthood, a better friend to him than any other person. It would be interesting to learn the origins of their bond. The troll's parental relationship to Kristoff is always presented as friendly, but the dynamic between them has some red flags. With minimal context at the beginning of Frozen, if the audience is to assume anything, it would be that young Kristoff might be the son of one of the ice harvesters that he loyally accompanies to work. At the very least, he knows these guys. While no adults say anything directly to Kristoff during the ice harvesting scene or vice versa, he's with them the entire time and is clearly connected to this in some way. Kristoff and Sven then stumble upon a troll colony, at which point one of the trolls hugs them and proclaims, Cuties, I'm gonna keep you. Um, what? Kristoff later shares that he was raised by the trolls and considers them his family, but that doesn't justify why the trolls abducted a human child and reindeer to keep as their own. It would be different if Kristoff was shown as a distressed wanderer, or if viewers definitively knew he doesn't have another family. But since he was with the Ice Harvesters earlier, surely one of them is related to him or knows him somehow. Somewhere out there, could there be a family worried about the child they lost in the woods and never found? Regardless, Kristoff's upbringing doesn't seem to bother him, and if he has any memories of his life before the trolls, he never talks about it on screen. When playtime goes wrong and young Elsa accidentally strikes Anna with her icy powers, the royal family seeks healing and answers from the trolls. Grand Poppy, leader of the trolls, heals Anna, but decides to remove any memories she has of Elsa's magic. He also gives strict, dramatic instructions to Elsa to control her powers, warning her, Fear will be your enemy. <laughs> no. To prevent harm that may happen in the future from Elsa's unpredictable powers, her parents then reduce their staff and limit Elsa's interactions with others going forward. Poor Elsa. She has abilities she doesn't understand, and rather than patiently offering guidance and helping her find a solution, every authority figure around Elsa instead frightens her with worst-case scenarios and extreme overreactions. Even worse, she has to hide who she is from her sister, her closest friend. Grandpoppy doesn't handle that conversation the way he should, and Elsa's parents likewise make the situation worse despite their intentions. As the audience later witnesses, Elsa is fated to deal with the implications of this traumatizing moment of parenting for the rest of her life. It was a cameo that was endlessly freeze-framed. Blink and you'll miss it, but during the song for the first time in forever, sharp-eyed viewers can spot Disney royalty among the crowd. As the gates of Arendelle open and Anna excitedly bounces through the sea of people arriving to celebrate Elsa's coronation day, among the guests are none other than Rapunzel and Flynn Rider from 2010's Tangled. Yes, the Fitzherberts themselves are right here in Arendelle, but why are they here? And how did they know Elsa? To answer that, fans may need to take a deep dive into Disney conspiracy theories. In 2014, Frozen filmmakers participated in an Ask Me Anything session on Reddit. Upon being asked where Anna and Elsa's parents were traveling to when their ship crashed, director Jennifer Lee said they were going to a wedding and suggested that the parents survived and wound up on the shores of Africa, giving birth to Tarzan. A Tumblr user took the ball and ran with it, suggesting the wedding in question was Rapunzel and Flynn's, which would add validity to the couple's cameo in Frozen. Going further down the rabbit hole, it was suggested that the crashed ship was the vessel explored by Ariel and Flounder in The Little Mermaid. The events of Frozen 2 render this theory null and void, of course, but it's still fun to imagine. Sometimes, it seems, a hidden character is nothing more than just that. 
Viewers first meet Wandering Oaken when Anna stumbles upon his trading post in Frozen. He sells anything a traveler might need for their journey, as well as offering a relaxing sauna session, which his family is enjoying at the time of Anna's visit. As luck would have it, Oaken is hosting a big summer blowout with everything marked down. It's all in the name, but Wandering Oaken does indeed do his share of venturing out and about over the course of the Frozen series, despite seemingly having permanent residence in a cabin in the woods. Quite the entrepreneur, in the 2015 short film Frozen, Frozen Fever, Oaken operates a mobile pharmacy, while in 2019's Frozen 2, he's a mobile manicurist. While the audience might not know Oaken's full backstory, he's a man of many talents and seems to be in the right place at the right time whenever these characters need something he sells. Prince Hans hails from the Southern Isles, Wesselton to be exact, which is, as its duke so frequently insists, pronounced Wesselton, not Weaseltown. Your Majesty, the Duke of Weaseltown. Wesselton! Duke of Wesselton. When Hans arrives in Arendelle, it doesn't take long for Princess Anna to become smitten with him. After only one evening together, the two decide to get married. It's all a ruse, however. After Elsa flees following an icy incident, Hans ultimately reveals his plan to take over the throne of Arendelle no matter the cost, even if it means killing Anna and Elsa. Once things get sorted out, Arendelle royal staff send Hans and the Duke back to Wesselton, where they're hopeful that Hans's twelve older brothers will dutifully punish them. In Frozen Fever, fans get a small glimpse at what Hans is up to in Wesselton, scooping manure. It seems his brothers put him in his place after all, though it would be great to see what went down when Hans first returned. How did his family take it when they learned Hans attempted homicide? And where's the Duke? Hans and anything to do with Wesselton is absent in Frozen 2 as the story moves on to other narratives and characters. For Elsa to be cursed with the power of ice and snow, there are certainly a lot of extra capabilities she seems to possess that have nothing to do with temperature. Perhaps the most ridiculous is that she can… create life? Yep, Elsa can apparently insert life into snow. From Olaf the Huggable Snowman to Marshmallow the Terrifying Snow Monster. Granted, Frozen 2 adds a little more credibility to Elsa's seemingly bizarre skill set. It turns out that she's actually the fifth spirit along with earth, air, fire, and water that make up the elements of nature. Elsa's powers derive from her mother selflessly saving her father when the couple was young. Nature rewarded Elsa's mom's heroism with Elsa's powers. This might not add clarity to any common thread among Elsa's odd abilities, but it at least gives some reasoning behind why they're more than just ice. Charades is the activity of choice during family game night in Frozen 2. When it's Olaf's turn and he has to mime the word mouse, he promptly puts two of his circle-shaped coals on either side of his head, cocks out his heel, puts one of his arms out, and puts on a huge smile. This is an unmistakable charade of Mickey Mouse. Kristoff correctly guesses the word from Olaf's clues. Olaf could have simply acted like an actual mouse, maybe pretending to have whiskers or mimicking the nimble way a mouse eats cheese. The fact that he instead chooses to imitate Mickey implies a few things about Arendelle that makes this simple wink to Disney history complicated. If Kristoff and Olaf know who Mickey Mouse is, does that mean there's a Walt Disney Company in the fictional world of Frozen? But if the movies take place before the dawn of electricity, that means there's no such thing as cartoons or movies yet. How is Mickey a recognizable figure to them? Are tales of this plucky mouse passed on as oral stories? This logic could also be applied to Olaf Presents, a series of shorts in which Olaf acts out favorite Disney animated movies like The Little Mermaid and Moana. Best not to overthink it too much, perhaps. The geography of Arendelle and its surrounding village and forest are never quite explained in full detail. This leads to some questions about where the trolls lived during the events of Frozen and if they lived somewhere different during Frozen 2. The journey to visit the trolls is shown to be an extensive voyage in Frozen, but in Frozen 2, the trolls arrive rather quickly when the elements begin to invoke harm upon Arendelle. This implies that even if the trolls still live in their colony in the mountains, it's considered within the confines of Arendelle's kingdom, since they experienced the elements the same as the rest of the village. Their swiftness and near comical abruptness arriving on scene to conveniently explain everything that's happening implies that they either moved closer to the kingdom proper or they're just really fast travelers who roll around all over the place. 
Olaf came to life through Elsa's magic, and in Frozen 2, viewers learn that his existence relies on Elsa's survival. As she becomes weak and eventually freezes, Olaf, for lack of a better word, dies. His snowman form disintegrates into snowflakes and rests itself in a pile. All's well that ends well, however, as Elsa is revived and is able to use that same pile of snow to bring Olaf back to life. This connection solidifies that there's clearly strong magic between Elsa and Olaf, though this is the first time that Elsa's health appears to have affected that of Olaf. For example, when Elsa was sick and frozen fever, Olaf seemed fine. Is it only life and death situations that prompt this connection between the two of them, or are there other circumstances that lead to something happening to Olaf as a result of what Elsa is experiencing? Also, can the bond ever go in the reverse direction where something happening to Olaf would affect Elsa? Oh, look at that. I've been impaled. <laughs> Living rock formations represent the earth element of the five spirits in Frozen 2. They're huge and destructive, and Anna realizes they're her only hope to set things right. She discovers that the dam at the river, thought to be a symbol of unity, was built with malicious intent. In order to save everyone, the dam must be broken. But how do you destroy a sturdy, generations-old structure? Some big, scary rock monsters might do the trick. Anna lures them toward the dam by acting as bait and directly guesses that the creatures will throw rocks at her. She utilizes some impeccable coordination skills running at full sprint while dodging boulders being tossed at her from behind. Sometimes she just barely dodges the rocks by inches. It's an impressive feat. Maybe it's that soon-to-be queen power or a rock radar akin to Spidey Sense, but Anna comes out on the other side without a scratch. In Frozen 2, we learn that Elsa is a fifth spirit of nature along with earth, air, fire, and water. Elsa first begins her journey to discovering who she really is by following a melodic call she hears in the distance. Eventually, she finds out that the call is being sung by none other than her deceased mother, beckoning her to learn her true purpose. So how does the afterlife work within the Frozen universe? Elsa's mother exists somewhere, despite having died in her physical form on Earth, and is visible to Elsa somewhat like a projection on the walls of an Cavern. Before Anna and Elsa's parents died in Frozen, it was clear that they didn't understand Elsa's powers in the slightest. In Frozen 2, Elsa's mom not only understands Elsa's powers, but is the authority on how she can step into what she was meant to do all along. What happened in between that led to this shift in perspective and awareness? How did Elsa's mother, in death, learn the truth? And how did she know how to contact Elsa? Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movie theories are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.